Okay, let's dive in then. So I'm Richard Esplin. I'm product manager at Evernim, uh, director of product at Evernim. Uh, I'm responsible for our contributions to open source communities, as well as best practices across our products. And uh, I've been I've spent quite a bit of time working on indie Aries, and Ursa, mostly indie though. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun project. So I'm excited to share with you today. Have a couple of slides. We'll move pretty quickly. But India as a project is a public permission blockchain. And the thing is, it's focused on identity and identity use cases. Uh, the contributors to India are worried about what's called self-sovereign identity, which is a privacy-preserving approach to transferring credentials, transferring uh, provable statements about uh, a person uh, between an issuer, a holder, and a verifier. Now, Indy is a blockchain system. For those who want to know how it works, it uses RBFT con uh, consensus, uh, redundant Byzantine fault tolerance. And this allows it, uh, if you know, you're at a Hyperledger conference, you probably know about Byzantine fault tolerance. But the idea is uh, you have a distributed set of nodes. They want to have a common view of the world, but you can't trust any particular node. How do you resolve that problem and do it at scale? So that's what Indy's good at. Indy, uh, one of the challenges when you have a blockchain uh, like that is, is getting responses quickly that you can trust. So Indy signs, uh, there's a state proof attached to every response that allows you to say, even if I only get it from one node, that it's trustworthy that that node's not lying to me. And so that speeds up read performance a lot. Uh, Indy's also, the way Indy's structured in self-sovereign identity, it doesn't have to, most communication in, in an identity use case happens off the ledger. So ledger performance uh, doesn't even factor in for most of the interactions, which is nice. And Indy's fairly flexible is a, is a distributed ledger. Uh, we put all the state, all the config, most of the configuration and all the permissioning on the ledger. And that's really nice because it goes through the same consensus protocol. Uh, it's very uh, pluggable uh, and it, it can be audited and you can see the history of permissions and, and state and all that kind of thing. And we followed a test-driven approach to development on Indy. So there are thousands and thousands of tests, uh, ranging from unit tests, integration tests, and even fairly complicated system tests to validate that the, that the system's reliable. So it, Indy has run in production on the Sovereign Network for over four years now, about four years. Uh, the And it's gotten quite a bit of real world use. So we're really proud of it as a system. Now, let's be a bit more specific about how this works. So when you're trying to exchange a credential, you've got an agent that represents you and you play one of three roles. You're the issuer, the person who's going to claim something about a third party. You're the holder, the person who's holding the claim uh, and wants to be trusted, or you're a verifier. The verifier does not trust the holder, but the verifier does trust the issuer. So when the issuer gives the holder this claim, uh, the credential, the holder can then give the credential to the verifier. The verifier can check the ledger and see that the, pu that the public key is correct and is signed with the correct private key and therefore knows that the holder didn't manipulate it and that the issuer does stand by what they're asserting about the holder. So the actual network then is this collection of indie nodes and, and each validator node it's really two projects at Hyperledger. It's node is the is the identity logic and plenum is the consensus layer. And I should say, if you have any questions, feel free to 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 put the question in the chat. Um, I see that there's some questions about, well, we'll come to the questions in a minute. I don't want to throw off my timing. Uh, so do put them in and we'll come to them. I appreciate uh, C's questions and Omar's. So the once you have these agents, uh, you or once you have this network uh, that the agents can talk to, then then you can do the credential exchange. And the actual project consists of the following pieces. You have plenum and node, that is the ledger. Uh, they use a cryptographic library called Ursa that's shared across a lot of hyperledger projects. And then you have client libraries that allow an agent to talk to the network. And there's two approaches used today. There's the Indy SDK that's been around for a long time. And, but people have taken the Indy SDK and they've split it into pieces and rewritten parts of it and try to make shared libraries that the Aries project can use. So Omar asked, what's the difference between Indy and Aries? Uh, Indy is the ledger. 
Aries is the protocol by which agents talk to each other and talk to the ledger. So they're, they're related projects, but they're different. And so uh, every indie agent is an Aries agent, it, but there are other Aries ledgers. Uh, so C-Chan asked about fabric. Uh, there is There are Aries projects that use fabric for verifiable credentials. And, and there are, um, we want to expand that to other ledgers as well on the Aries side. Uh, but Indy tries to set itself apart. Uh, there's a few things that, that make it really good for identity. The first is the permission system I told you about, the auth rules, that you can, is very flexible to adapt Indy for the governance policies you want for your network. So if you're on a network where, where you want to make sure that every, uh, in every transaction author uh, is endorsed, you know, Indy supports that. If it's a third-party endorsement to avoid spam or abuse, uh, you can also say, hey, a new endorser requires three signatures from stewards or two signatures from trustees. And that kind of process makes it really easy to adapt Indy to your, your ledger use case. Also is a pluggable net architecture. Uh, so Plem, uh, everything's implemented. Um, Plem supports adding new new transaction formats as a plugin. So people have done that to, to add tokens and other things. It's got a, a separate sub ledger called the audit ledger which keeps keeps the root hash of all the all the components of Indy, the domain ledger, the config ledger, the pool ledger. And that allows you to validate. You can always go back and say, oh, this was allowed at that point in time based on the permissions on the ledger at that point in time. Uh, it allows a transaction author agreement which stewards requested to be able to say for a public ledger uh, that you know the right to be forgotten is waived and some of these other regulatory requirements are, are complied with so stewards aren't legally liable. Uh, sometimes we, well, quite often when we set up an identity network, uh, most of the transactions are retransactions. Uh, there's not a lot of rights because only the issuer has to write to the ledger. And so uh, Indy will go through and check every so often to verify that all the, the everything's in consensus and that all the status is, is up to date. Uh, so, so people are getting the freshest results. Uh, there's some extensive capabilities for network monitoring that Indy implements. So anybody with the network monitor role can see actual validator state for any of the other nodes. So you can have this decentralized monitoring, but still also keep things like uh, things uh, uh, private away from attackers. So there's a, a nice governance there. And then we made a lot of improvements recently uh, that, that really move forward, in our opinion, the state of the art in, in, block, in distributed ledger technology, in how catch up works, how view change works, how the communication works. Uh, it's it's fast and resilient. It's been thoroughly tested. So that's the introduction to Indy. Uh, the we do have a weekly. It's actually a bi-weekly Zoom call now. Uh, it's every other Tuesday. This week week it was on. Uh, so in two weeks will be the next one. There's a link here in the wiki. Uh, we also communicate on Hyperledger Rocket Chat. Hope to see you there. Uh, there's a process for suggesting improvements. You can get the source code. I have posted these slides in Sked. The the scheduling software that the conference is using. So you can download these slides and get the links yourself. So that is the 10 minute intro to Indy. Um, I see just looking at questions. Is it easy to deploy Indy as an identity ledger next to Fabric? Yes. Uh, well, I don't know about in easy. It has been done. Uh, the people who have done it didn't, they said they'd write up their exactly what they did and why, uh, but I don't know the details about, uh, I, I didn't see that write up. So, uh, Generally, Fabric does have an identity system, uh, and you can use verifiable credentials on an indie ledger to be able to do to plug into the ident Fabric identity system. I'm not a Fabric expert, by the way. Um, but the other way people do it is they just use Fabric for a lot of things and then use Indy separately just for the credentials. It really depends on your use case how you'd want that integration work. And as I mentioned, uh, there are other uh, trust block that's presenting here at Hyperledger. They have added verifiable credentials to Fabric. Uh, is so that's another option. They've open sourced that work as well. Uh, but uh, Indy's tailored to this specific use case, whereas Fabric's meant meant to be you know a general purpose ledger. Uh, Plenum could be general purpose, but it's really only used for credentials. Uh, and so you'll find that there's some things that are quite a bit easier in Indy, just because you know Fabric's had a lot of other bells and whistles and things. So uh, that's a bit about what an identity focused ledger means. Uh, it's got pre built structures for credentials schemas. Uh, DIDs, uh, you know, all these kind of things are all built into the ledger, so you don't have to create them yourself. But of course, uh, if you go to TrustBlock, you can find their stuff. One of the things to recognize is when we created Indian Plenum for you know five years ago, uh, 
Fabric was brand new and it didn't have any of this stuff. So over time, Fabric has gained some of these capabilities, uh, but they're fairly new. Even TrustBlocks code has only been open for, you know, they've, they've really done a lot of that opening over the last 12 months. And so uh, Indy's got a lot more tutorials, instructions about how to do an identity stuff. And it'll guide you down the best practices for privacy-preserving anti-correlation credentials. Any other questions? And C, did that answer your question? And Omar, did that answer your question? You can come off mute. It's not a big group. So if anybody uh, has any other questions, feel free to post. Uh, I have, we got a couple of minutes. I'm on schedule. Fantastic. Let's take you through a quick demo. So I still don't get the role of Indy versus Aries. So uh, the there's a, let's go back uh, to this slide. Whoops. I went out of present mode. The Indy is the ledger. Uh, come on, present mode. Indy is the ledger and Aries is the protocol by which agents talk. That's what it is. So uh, I don't know if a five-year-old knows what the word protocol means. Uh, my five-year-old doesn't. But the all this tier up here, that's the actual credential exchange, that's all Aries. And this tier down here, the network, is Indy. So you could have Fabric here. You have other things. Uh, similarly, there are other approaches to credential exchange that are not Aries, such as uh, the one Microsoft uses or, or Secure, um, Secure Keys actually moved to an Aries compliant. But... Uh, you know, there are other ones uh, that are not Aries compliant um, that that do credential exchange that, that might be W3C compliant, but they don't do zero knowledge proof focused uh, Aries compliant protocols. So hopefully that helped, Omar. So Indy versus Aries, uh, as we dig in, as you dig in the project, you'll, you'll learn more, but I'm going to sidestep that in order to give you a demo. Uh, so this demo is like, what is a self-sovereign identity solution? using Aries agents. So the backend ledger is Indy, but everything else you see is really Aries. Uh, so we have this site. Uh, understand this is a developer machine. Try dot connect on, uh, try connect on me. Connect on me is Evernim's uh, mobile wallet that people can use. And here I'm sharing my screen. I've just got a fresh install. I'm going to hit the setup button, you know, and I'm going to put in a really super secure passcode. And I'm not going to worry about biometrics for this use case. Uh, I accept the Everton license agreement and we come in. Uh, now there's a scan button. So I come here and uh, I've got uh, various organizations I can interact with. Let's uh, let's say I've got a job at Suncrest Medical. So I need to get my staff passport. So when I take a picture of this, a QR code comes up. I come back to my mobile device and take the picture. I just realized I can't take the picture while you're seeing me take the picture. Let me do that. Okay, so that came, comes in. So now I've got a connection, an Aries connection with Suncrest Medical. And uh, I got my login information, uh, Alice Jones, and I'm going to accept this. Got to tap it in the mobile device, not on the screen. And so you see here that it's creating that connection. This is running off a, one of my developers, one of my team members' laptops. <laughs> this is not a very fast machine. Um, we're going to get this posted somewhere more public in a little bit. So that comes through. And now it says, you know, that's done. I'm getting a credential from them, my staff passport credential. And this is going to refresh. Congratulations, you have this. And you'll see it in your app. So now I'm going to come in and get my proof of employment. And similarly, the QR code comes up. So I'm going to take a picture. Now I can show you uh, that came through quicker. So here I'm a nurse practitioner and accept that credential. And now if I come up here, I can look at my connections. I've got Suncrest Medical in here and I've got my two credentials from them. And I come through and see you know, those credentials, that kind of thing. So now we're going to come back uh, and let's let's use this to get a loan. So I'm going to apply for my mortgage loan. I, you know, they want their they they want me to know I'm going to need to provide proof of employment and a financial statement. So I've got both of those ready. So we come in, create another connection. Uh, 
Um, I just did something out of order on the demo. Um, it says, hey, I'm missing a credential. I thought I got my two credentials I need. Uh, so I do not have my my total withdrawals. Oh, that's because I haven't got my credit union credential yet. Um, apologies for going out of order. Uh, and we're almost done. So I come in the credit union and I can get my financial statement. And then I'll be able to do my thing. So now I'm going to accept that credential. You can see that going through. And now I can go back and give those proofs to the, uh, to the, to get my loan. So take my picture here. And it's telling me I still I'm still missing a credential. Which credential am I? Total withdrawals is on my. Did I go too fast? Oh, I did go too fast. You see, my credit union one is still coming in. If I come to my my credentials, so my fi financial statement is in. This should be in now. Let's try this again. Okay, that time it worked. So they started the total withdrawals. And I can go through and validate exactly what I'm sharing. I'm in control. I can select which credential it comes from. Uh, some e verifiers might allow me to enter a manual attribute, you know, a manual versus a verifiable credential. Uh, and then I can share that, share that all that. And I hit OK there. And then it goes through. So I've shared that information with large loans. And large loans can now come back and say, look, I've got my loan. And then they can come back and approve it and give me a, a, an approval credential. When I click that, uh, I'll get a push notification here. So we're out of time, but you can see my, my loan approval here. And I can accept. Any, any other questions? Anything else you'd like to talk about or like to see? We don't have to leave the room immediately. Could Indy be used to calculate a summary based on a larger set of data and present it to verifiers? So the ledger is, is only used to store the issuer public keys and, and the verifier, uh, well-known verifiers will store their information there, as well as to manage the revocation registry. So uh, Indy doesn't, doesn't calculate summaries. That's something the agents do. And one of the goals of self-sovereign identity is that each agent, each holder holds their own data. So nobody has a global privacy preserve, uh, pri anti-privacy uh, view of the ecosystem. Uh, it's meant to be a privacy preserving ecosystem, make it hard for you to get that kind of global view that will allow you to, to build summary data of, of the kind of credentials everybody has. Now each issuer and each verifier, they can keep track of the information that they, the credentials they give out and the credentials they verify. But you can't get it across the entire system. That's that's uh, you'd have to use a different tool for that and for a different use case. So in the case of financial statements, what is stored? All your bank transactions and the requesting party only requests and gets the totals. Uh, the answer to that is the issuer, the bank. You know they store all their own data. The question is, what data are they going to share with the holder in order to th that the holder can then give to a verifier? And so I can go through and see, in this case, exactly what it is. And now, if I'm a holder, I might get additional information from, from the bank, but I probably don't want to share it. And so it's really up to me as the identity owner to decide how that data should be used. What are the complications in upgrading a public permission ledger like Sovereign to reflect the latest releases of Indy? Well, currently, the challenge with uh, Sovereign is a, a, an ecosystem of, of lots of different stewards, and each of those stewards need to upgrade on their own. Uh, we're currently going through a fairly complicated upgrade because Indy was this, it was originally it's designed to be platform operating system independent, but we've only tested on Ubuntu 16.04 for the last three years because that's what all the stewards were running. Ubuntu 16.04 has uh, been deprecated since end of life, so Sovereign's on extended support for that, and we need to get everybody to upgrade to Ubuntu 20.04. So getting 75 different organizations to upgrade their operating system in addition to Indy is kind of complicated. Uh, we're in that process. 
in general, though, Sovereign does track the releases of Indie pretty close. Uh, usually within about six weeks of an Indie release, Sovereign does the upgrade. Uh, but the challenge is communicating with the stewards, making sure they know what's in it, uh, that they're comfortable, that that they've had the opportunity to review that code, and you know, it's decentralized. Every steward can decide whether or not they upgrade. Uh, for example, we have a Fabric Ledger. It's easier to, spo easier to deploy, deploy Indie as the identity ledger next to it. Oh, we talked about that one already. So I think I answered all the questions and excellent questions. I appreciate uh, C, James, and Omar, all your questions. Any other questions you'd like to cover? Was that a useful demo? Okay, I'm supposed to end the session five minutes ago. So <laughs> I'll let you all go. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Andres, for for give me some reinforcements hard in a in a remote <laughs> conference to get a sense of what people think. Uh, okay, thank you. We'll see you in the next session.